Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. Today we're here with Arthur Haynes, an expert in wild foods, plant medicine, and living like our wild ancestors. I had the pleasure of hosting a panel with Arthur at the Paleo Effects Conference, and let me just say that you can learn a thing or two from the way he lives his life off the grid in the wilderness. So pay attention, this episode might just change your life. Along those lines, I'll be speaking again at the Paleo Effects Conference and the Paleo Effects Entrepreneurs Event coming up, as well as a few colleges, conferences, and special events across the country. So join my newsletter at fatburningman.com to get all the details. I'd love to meet you in person. And uh, along those lines, I'd like to give a quick reminder to those of you who have been listening for a while and uh, an announcement for those of you who might be new to us, that at fatburningman.com, we have every new episode of this show written up. So if you don't have time to listen to the whole thing, I know sometimes you know 40 to 60 minutes can be a long time, especially if you're crunch for time. You can get the entire blog post at fatburningman.com under the person's name that I'm interviewing. Every episode of this show is available for free. You can get video versions. You can get audio versions of the show. And also for episodes in the past one to two years, we've been writing up an entire blog posts, transcript with key takeaways from every episode. So if you just have a few minutes and you want to learn about a particular subject, like what's the best way to train for a marathon? How do I burn fat as quickly as possible? What's the deal with ketosis and intermittent fasting? What should I put in my coffee? If you have any questions about that, just go to fatburningman.com and there's probably an interview or a blog post that's ready for you with key takeaways uh, that you can get and you don't have to listen to an interview or watch a whole interview either. But I wanted to make this information available to you no matter how you want to get it. So text, video, audio, it's all there for you at fatburningman.com. Check it out and it's totally free. Before we get to the show, I have something quick to share with you. When I first overhauled my nutrition plan with a primitive version of the wild diet, I dropped about 20 pounds in just over a month. Now, I'm very happy to say, you readers and listeners are making me look like a complete slacker. We recently kicked off a 30-day challenge in our online community, the Fat Burning Tribe, and we had over 2,000 people join us as members of the tribe to participate from more than 20 countries across the world. So congrats to all of you who joined in the Wild Diet 30-day challenge. Your stories always bring a smile to my face. So here's one of my favorite success stories from Joshua, who just beat sugar addiction. 20 pounds down in 30 days. I'm really feeling great. I'm a recovering sugar addict and I've fallen off the paleo wagon so many times in the past few years. The wild diet has been different. The meal plans, the tribe support, the guilt-free desserts, and especially the green smoothies. Where have these been all my life? Have made the wild diet stick where basic paleo didn't. I'm a long-time listener to the podcast, but getting the book and meal plans made a huge difference. I can't recommend it strongly enough. Congratulations, Joshua, and thank you so much. So we have more good news. During the challenge, tribe members said that the Wild Diet 30-Day Meal Plans are the best nutrition and shopping resources they've used in a long time. So we're going to make monthly done-for-you wild meal plans a part of the membership in our online community. When you join the Fat Burning Tribe, you'll now get a new set of 30-day meal plans every single month. So you'll never have to worry about what you're cooking for dinner again. And the best part is that these monthly meal plans are a $47 value and they're totally included in your tribe membership. So the Wild Diet is about changing your attitude toward food, eating the most nutritious food you can find and afford, and changing your habits for a lifetime of health. It's really less of a diet and more of a lifestyle, as many people who come on board quickly realize. So if you're ready to start eating delicious food and shedding stubborn fat, check out the Fat Burning Tribe. All you have to do is go to, from any device, fatburningtribe.com. That's fatburningtribe.com. All right, on to the show with the wild man himself, Arthur Haynes. You're about to learn the surprising benefits of eating wild foods, what it's like to live off the grid in the wilderness, why domestication has damaged the health of plants, animals, and humans alike, how to liberate your thinking from the status quo, and much more. All right, let's go hang out with Arthur. Hi, folks. I'm very excited to be here this week with Arthur Haynes, who grew up in the western mountains of Maine, a rural area that was home to swift streams known for their trout fishing. He spent most of his childhood in the Sandy River Valley hiking, tracking, and foraging. Arthur now runs the Delta Institute of Natural History in Canton, Maine, where he teaches people the value of foraging, wild crafting medicine, and primitive living skills. How are you, Arthur? I'm great. I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of your program. 
Absolutely. Yeah, so I grew up in the backwoods of New Hampshire. Now we're in the middle of nowhere in the Smoky Mountains, which is awesome. But it's a totally different world than the suburbs and certainly urban living where most people are used to. So if you follow the, the rat race, it seems easy to be disconnected from where we came from as humans, disconnected from nature. So how does living in the boonies like you do change your approach to how you live and, and view the world? Well, there's a lot of directions we could go with that question, but certainly one of the things that it opens up is a lot of opportunity to actually practice uh, mm -hmm. things like foraging and wildcrafting medicine or even hunting for um, people that are interested in that particular pursuit. Uh, I think a lot of people have a great deal of interest in these particular things, but um, you know, with I think it's about 80% of our population lives in an urban setting, wow. we don't always get the opportunity to actually follow through on some of these things that uh, I think a lot of people would really enjoy participating in. Yeah. So what's it like to be a wild man? How do you, how do you spend your day? How about that? <laughs> Well, my, my day it has some very wild components and some not so wild components. Um, what I try to do is demonstrate to people that this is something, uh, regardless of what your lifestyle, that you can participate in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really do mean even people who are living in suburban and ur urban areas, there's always places to participate at least in some component of these activities. Um, you know, modern day living involves property ownership. Mm -hmm. And as we try to purchase more land. There is property taxes that go along with those things. Um, so it necessitates having a job to pay for those things so that we can have this wonderful property. I wish you could see it. I mean, we're in the middle of over a thousand acres of forest where wow. we're parked. Yeah. Um, but what we do is we make sure that a lot of our spare time is dedicated to being outdoors gathering things that we use here in our home. So even though I live in a in a relatively modern home, it's a solar powered off the grid home, um, it's what we do outside of the home and the things we bring back to the home that allow us to sort of touch base with those hunter gatherer lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So what being someone who lives that lifestyle <laughs> as you drink from that, I love it. Your water glass is different from mine. <laughs> but what are some of the things that, that really inform what you do that city folks, suburban folk might have lost touch, of, touch with? Well, I mean, I essentially let, you know, the research that I've done into hunter-gatherer lifestyles really guide a lot of what I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not one of those people that thinks that, you know, they had everything perfect and it was Eden and right. everything is screwed up now. Sure. That's not what's happening. But but certainly if if anyone digs into the medical anthropological research, you can identify a number of features about hunter-gatherers that surpass the quality of life that we have there yeah. and and i'm sure you know your um your listeners are already familiar with a lot of this stuff like chronic disease mm -hmm. happiness and contentedness and this kind of thing and so we are trying to pull in all of those elements that we can into this modern life essentially recognizing that um you know, there are some things that we may not want to follow, but we're going to do as much of it as we can so that we enjoy a diet that is closer to theirs than mm -hmm. what most people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Water and medicine that's closer to theirs, even our clothing. The yeah. way we raise our child is based on a lot of principles that um, anthropologists had recorded. In other words, giving sovereignty to the young person instead of considering them somebody to just rule over and mm -hmm. they have to do your bidding. For, um, and, and so it, those are the great things I love about it. It's possible for anyone to do this kind of stuff, at least to some extent. And I'm just trying to show uh, this is a path that we're moving forward into the future, not trying to go backwards into the past. Absolutely. And there's a lot of value, though, in, in seeing uh, th the way that people used to live just as a function of what was available around them. Uh, Medicine, for instance. I know you're, you're really into wildcrafting medicine. When I was growing up, uh, I 
unfortunately became allergic to pretty much every antibiotic there is when I was an infant. And so my mom actually became an herbalist and uh, started practicing holistic medicine because there really wasn't any other way to heal me. So I was I was raised on all of these stinky bombs and tonics and, and stuff <laughs> like that. And I, I think a lot of the health that I'm experiencing today is, is really due to that and the way that I was raised, especially after I was an infant. So can you talk about the value of using wild plants as medicine? Yeah, I mean, there are a few things that I would I would love for people to consider. Of course, we're dealing with a population here in the United States where people are actually, whether they want to admit it or not, have a fear of wild things. Mm -hmm. And so we have this huge obstacle to get over because we're just convinced that we're going to poison ourselves using wild plants. And the thing that I like to share with people is if they realize that they can poison themselves from wild plants, they're already admitting that they have a a belief in the phytochemistry of plants. <laughs> right. They believe in the potency of plants. Mm -hmm. And what they have to understand is, you know, for example, just here in New England, we have 3,500 species of plants. Mm -hmm. Isn't it possible that some of those have beneficial actions and not all detrimental actions? Yeah. And the answer, of course, is yes. Um, so one of the things or excuse me some of the other things that i like to mention about wild plant medicines you mentioned antibiotics that mm -hmm. you uh, had developed an allergy to the great thing about wild plant medicines especially those that um, are made using the typical preparations that herbalists use mm -hmm. is they actually don't extract a single chemical into the water or the alcohol as people build teas and tinctures respectively, but they extract a whole suite of chemicals that all act on the bacterium, the virus, the fungus, whatever the pathogenic species is that mm -hmm. uh, people are interested in treating. And given that you have all of these chemicals operating on this organism, they don't have an ability to develop a resistance in the same way they do with pharmaceutical drugs that are typically a single chemical right. and much easier to gain resistance. So um, I have friends that have asked for assistance with MRSA, methicillin-resistant mm -hmm. Staphylococcus aureus, and where um, the pharmaceutical drug was failing for them, we were able to treat these things using plants that we had gathered from the landscape. So that's an example of the potency of wild plant medicine. But one of the things that um, most people don't think about is when we take medicine, a portion of that passes unmetabolized through our body and enters obviously the waste stream which goes sure. out into the sewers and in some urban centers that water is recycled for use in the home again. And unfortunately, the uh, methods that they use to essentially cleanse this water of the waste is not able to remove pharmaceutical compounds. Mm -hmm. So when you're using these kinds of medicines, um, all of that is going out into the environment. So the antidepressants, the anti-fertility drugs, the antibiotics, everything, whether it's the wildlife in a rural setting or the people in an urban setting, are actually getting dosed with these sub-therapeutic amounts every single day throughout the year when they're using their water. Mm -hmm. Great thing about herbal medicine is you're using medicine that's already present on your landscape. When these plants drop their leaves, those compounds go into the soil, into the water, and when they pass through your body, it's the same thing. They're already present and you're not adding sort of a, a low level pharmaceutical pollution to the landscape. So it's actually a way that we protect the cleanliness of our drinking water is by using herbal medicine rather than pharmaceutical drugs. And a lot of these ancient herbal um, tonics, teas, plants, uh, what have you, are massively effective, especially for certain conditions. And a lot of people just have no idea. Yeah, I don't think people really realize um, how much science there is now behind a lot of the herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. um, there are literally tens of peer-reviewed journals where um, ethnobotanical medicines are presented and discussed and research is 
um, there and available for people to read about. Um, we don't see that here in the United States very much because the cost of bringing a, a new drug to market is between two and a half and five billion dollars these days. And what pharmaceutical company is going to conduct research on, say, the um, antimicrobial potential of staghorn sumac when yeah. people can just walk out and gather it themselves? Right. So all of the research is, or most of the research is done in Europe and Asia. And if people are not going after journals in that part of the world, they simply won't ever see how much research there is supporting the use of plant and fungal medicines, especially. Mm -hmm. Now, what about from the, the, I guess, meditative, spiritual, mental side of things? For me, I know that whenever I was getting angsty growing up, going for a walk in the woods did something to me that going for a walk in the city didn't do to me, right? <laughs> when I started living in an urban lifestyle, I think so many people uh, really have lost sight of of the magic in all of that. So can you just advocate, I guess, for on behalf of nature, What what is the power of that? Why is it so important for us as humans? Well, I mean, the, one of the most important things that we need to remember is that our species did nothing but live on wild landscapes through its entire evolution until really recently. Mm -hmm. And you know, knowing that agriculture began 10 to 12,000 years ago, for many people in different parts of the world, agriculture is actually much newer than that. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been a tremendously long time that we've been dealing with structures that break up our landscape. I mean, humans were originally very focus oriented. They focused on um, sites of importance to them that were interconnected with all of these trails. And now we have a very different focus. It's sort of a a completely different contextual framework of how we view the landscape. It's very boundary focused now. Mm -hmm. I can go here. I mm -hmm. can't go there. Uh, that just changes the way we think about everything. But given that we live here in the United States and, you know, if there isn't a study documenting it, we're just not going to believe it. Yeah. We don't have that ability um, or not all of us maybe have that ability to sort of intuitively decide for ourselves, you know, yes, the sun is beneficial for me. It isn't something that just always causes cancer. Mm -hmm. So there actually is lots of study now looking at people spending time in nature and the effects to them um, as much as little as a five minute walk in a forest or a field or some type of natural setting away from buildings has been shown to have this suite of health effects, lowering our blood pressure, calming, heartbeat decline, uh, in, I mean, in a beneficial way, indicating a drop in the stress levels they're feeling. And in fact, people who took a five minute walk in say a parking lot or a supermarket or something had elevated levels of all of these things that we're talking about. Yeah. We're natural beings. We hail from that setting, and it only makes sense that the more time that we're able to spend there, the better off we're going to be from that nature connection, that spiritual sense that affects our physical health. Yeah. One of the fascinating things is how habituated I think we all become to the constant stimulus of bright colors, advertising, flashing lights, <laughs> big sounds everywhere, yeah. and uh, it's such that where I came from, where you live, uh, you get used to hearing birds and squirrels and the wind against the trees and, and babbling of brooks. There's something about that that kind of puts you into a different brain state. Uh, you don't necessarily realize it. You take it for granted. On the flip side, when you when you go to city living and, and you're used to that, all of a sudden it's it's no wonder why we're, why we're freaked out all the time if there's, you know, a uh, uh, fire engine blaring in the background and you might be hungry when you wouldn't otherwise be because there's a picture of a hamburger right there with the color red, which kind of like freaks you out. So <laughs> is there anything that you can do to kind of bridge that gap and get a taste of the way that we're supposed to live in the modern world? Well, I, I l always love to uh, sort of share concepts with the people, uh, particularly the students that come to me as opposed to recipes. Mm. And instead of telling people, okay, go find a park and make sure you spend 10 minutes a day there or whatever the case sure. might be, here are the concepts that we need to think about. 
our, our city landscapes, our urban landscapes, have a few things about them. There's tremendous noise pollution and there's tremendous light pollution. Right. All of these things affect us. The noise pollution gets us to actually turn off from stimuli. And that's the weirdest thing to imagine that you have to stop perceiving your environment to right. keep yourself sane. Right. I mean, that's we, that's never happened before. And of course, the light pollution is affecting our sleep and our other uh, circadian rhythms. And the other thing about an urban setting is it actually lacks complexity. Everything is a square, rectangle, sphere. These are the mm -hmm. way that engineers build things because it's easier for us to do so. Instead of, I mean, you can just imagine the infinite complexity of a forest with branches and leaves going in every angle at every depth of strata. And we're supposed to see that. Our developing minds, when we're children, we're supposed to essentially build an awareness based on that high complexity. Mm -hmm. So find settings that are highly complex visually and do not have all of the sound and light pollution um, that cities have. And these are the places that you can develop that sense of peace and relax and reground yourself. And those kind of settings are generally available in a lot of places, whether uh, even if you can't walk to them, they may be a short drive or a bus ride to get to some place where you can at least tone down on the sound and light to some extent. Yeah. I, think, I think a lot of people have access to some setting where they can get that combination of features for some part of the day. Yeah. And it just, it takes doing it. It takes building that habit. And I can say uh, a lot of the listeners know that my wife and I spent the last year traveling around uh, the country and the world and mostly living out of state and uh, national parks out of our trailer. And, and it was a big culture shock kind of going from that living in Austin, Texas for a while to selling everything, including our cars and li living out of a trailer in the middle of the wilderness. Awesome. But <laughs> whenever we went to a, a new place, and sometimes we did stay you know, in cities, visited friends or whatever, but the first thing that we uh, kind of created the habit of doing is going on Google Maps, looking for the green and being like, all right, let's take the dog there. <laughs> right. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people hesitate to um, to assume that there is that natural beauty around them somewhere close. Uh, but the fact the fact is that almost everywhere, everywhere we went, we could find some body of water, some tiny little park or some just kind of abandoned spot where you could sit down, have a little picnic or enjoy yourself and take a break from the constant stresses of urban life. So are there any other things that, that can kind of encourage people to get out of their comfort zone to go and live in the world that, that I know you live in? <laughs> well, it's, it's familiarity. Um, mm. We're going to spend time in the places that we're most familiar. And if we're most familiar with human zoos, the cities, yeah. that's where we're going to spend our time. Right. Um, and so the more time that people spend in these areas, and, and particularly as they start to learn to recognize the other life that we share the planet with, and I don't mean that we have to be a plant taxonomist, but recognizing that's an oak, that's a pine, that's a maple. Mm -hmm. um, even that level, there's a familiarity that increases that really draws people out to, oh, that's the tree that I love to be under when it's really sunny because of the shade. Mm -hmm. That's a plant that I've tasted before and that memory is still in there. Um, I really think familiarity, which you can't have if you're unwilling to sort of initiate those experiences, really helps get people out of that human zoo setting. Yeah, and also going to look for the food that might be much closer than you think in your backyard in a lot of cases. So we, we grew yeah. up, growing up in New Hampshire, there were so many things there that we, that kind of popped up all the time. And, and we didn't even realize we had cranberries in our, in our field behind the house um, for years. And we had wild strawberries for parts of the seasons. We had uh, blueberries, huckleberries, you name it. It was incredible. But one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the fruit that you find in the wild is fundamentally different from what you find in the supermarket in so many different ways. So can you talk about how uh, the fruit that we're kind of designed to eat, the, the fruit that our ancestors were eating, how is that different from modern fruits? Well, and, and this is, of course, on average, Abel, because sure. uh, there are, the, you know, there are always exceptions. But by and large, the wild foods that we would take, the wild fruits that we're talking about now that we would gather from the landscape have um, four primary differences. Um, one is they tend to be more nutrient dense. Mm -hmm. 
And this is especially true when we start talking about some of the other kinds of foods um, like the leafy greens and things like that. Um, they are much richer phytochemically because the breeding has not created any loss of that chemistry that the plant uses to defend itself against the sun, against insects, against viral pathogens. Mm -hmm. And the really neat thing is this has actually been looked at in a number of studies where um, ones that I'm familiar with looking at blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, I mean, these are very common fruits that many people would know if they were to see them. Um, and these studies all show that the wild versions contain significantly more phenolic compounds, which contribute, uh, in this case, to a higher antioxidant mm -hmm. capacity mm -hmm. than cultivated foods. And sometimes we're talking about nearly twice as much antioxidant ability, which is no wonder the indigenous people that relied exclusively on these foods, uh, one of the reasons anyways, that they experienced virtually no cancer during their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. um, another difference is they tend to have a slightly better omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio mm -hmm. skewed toward the omega-3 fatty acids when we look at all wild foods in general. Um, and the last um, difference is they had more fiber. Mm -hmm. um, so that meant that you got fewer calories per unit mass, which many of us could benefit from. Sure. Um, but that extra fiber would have also contributed um, in a, a variety of ways to uh, gastrointestinal health. Mm -hmm. um, and, and including, in some cases, one of the great things about uh, using these foods in today's world is that this fiber is able to help mop up toxins that we might be eating that are on our foods uh, just to keep us a little bit more protected from some of the environmental pollution that we deal with, um, you know, in, in sort of the modern age. Right. But those are the four primary differences between um, cultivated foods and wild foods. Yeah. And boy, when you travel internationally and, you know, we went to Bali and, and Fiji, for example, just the uh, the bananas in, in Thailand and all those other different places, you know, in, in America, oh, it's a banana, right? It's one kind. You go over there and they have pits and some of them are huge. Some of them are tiny. They're so different. They have a creaminess or, or a tartness. There is this, you know, massive cornucopia of different kinds of the same plant. And when you go into your backyard, when you go in and forage, you kind of find the same thing. You also find that they're a lot less sweet, right? So, and that has something to do with the fiber in a lot of cases, right? Uh, so, yeah, I would imagine if, if you're out there foraging, you're probably exposed to a lot more different kinds of food than most people are. What are the benefits of that? Well, you're, you're definitely exposed to a lot, a lot more foods. Um, though I have never found the source for this number, you'll see it presented all over the Internet and even written into text that most mm -hmm. People living, say, in the United States only consume about 30 species of plants a year. Hmm. And you, if you were to make a list of plants, you'd immediately say, wait, I eat a lot more than that. But you'd have to remember that many of the things that we consume are actually the same species, but simply um, represent different cultivars. You know, a great right. example is, you know, broccoli and cauliflower and kohlrabi and kale. These are all the exact same species Even Brussels sprouts, uh, called right? brassica. Yeah, and, and more. Yeah. And there are many squashes that all represent the exact same species. Um, and so we actually eat less plant diversity than we think, which means we pull in less phytochemical diversity mm -hmm. into our body um, that we use to modulate our immune systems, to fight infection, to deal with systemic inflammation. And when we look at hunter-gatherers around the world and the numbers of plants that they've eaten, uh, keep in mind, a lot of this information on the numbers of species they ate was collected in the 60s, 70s, 80s. In other words, the indigenous had already, in very uh, likelihood anyways, begun to lose some of their ethnobotanical mm -hmm. knowledge. And yet they still had numbers even in the uh, even in the deserts of africa the sp people were consuming you know 86 species of plants mm. you go to the far northern um, northwestern alaska where the anupia are situated and they were eating 40 species of plant um, the cherokee of the southeastern united states over 100 species were being consumed mm -hmm. so even though we are americans and we can sort of import all of this food um, from all over the world 
world, we still tend to eat fewer plants than the hunter-gatherers did right from their own landscapes. Yeah. And one of the things um, I think is important for people to always keep in mind is dietary diversity equals dietary sufficiency. Mm -hmm. In other words, the more diverse you eat, the more likely you are to pull in the nutrition you need because it's not just the amounts, but it's sometimes even the ratios that are important to make sure, sure that you're properly utilizing uh, vitamins and minerals. Yeah. Now, before this interview, you you brought up something about child rearing, uh, which you're in the middle of right now, as I understand. And I was yeah. talking to uh, our mutual friend, Daniel Vitalis, a, a bit about this. Uh, child rearing in the modern world is fantastically different from what it used to be. Right. And, and so I would be very interested in hearing your approach to all of this and how it would be different from, you know, the, the normal go to. I, I, it's so hard to sort of boil this down to a nutshell. This is actually where I wish I were Daniel just for a moment. Yeah. I feel he's, su he does such a great job of taking a broad complex topic and bringing it down to, you know, just a few sentences, mm -hmm. but essentially almost everything that differs between hunter gatherers with child rearing and people here in the United States, it, it can come down to almost one word and that's sovereignty. Hmm. Hunter gatherers considered young children to be their own person. They were not property. They were not there to be ruled and told what to do. And, you know, because I said so, they were not hit and struck because you wouldn't do that to an adult. They were treated like an adult, except that, of course, there needed to be allowances for their size and for the fact they were dependent on the people in their group um, for food, for medicine, for caregiving and those kinds of things. In the United States, it's incredibly different. Um, they are considered practically like property, um, and we can do all manners of things to them that we would not be allowed to do even to another adult in our community. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, spanking is always one of the great examples in this type of physical punishment. If, I mean, if I did to somebody in my community, an adult, what I what some people do to their children, I could be arrested for assault. Mm -hmm. And so we simply take all of that into account. And instead of just, you know, sort of saying, no, you can't do that, there's an explanation of why that's not the case. Even long before she could understand the vocabulary, she could certainly understand a tone of presentation that mm -hmm. we were trying to provide. Mm -hmm. So we really try to always treat her like she is her own person. And how would we interact with an adult if they were doing something that we saw as dangerous or they might break something that we didn't want them to touch, um, you know, those kinds of um, situations that often arise with children. We consider to her to be a sovereign human. Hmm. What about diet? What is she eating? Uh, she eats what we eat, uh, and it's never been any different except of the course that she, you know, in her first almost year of life, it wasn't until really around 10 months of age that she started having any food other than breast milk, mm -hmm. and she's still breastfeeding, and I don't see any slowing down of that. Uh, I'm guessing it will be probably another year or more before she stops that. Wow. Um, but she eats what we eat. And that means even, you know, it could have been beef or venison or bear. I mean, she loves all of these foods. Uh, but at first, we might have had to pre-chew it for her because she simply didn't have the dentition and the skill to use what teeth she had. Um, bear it's is really pretty chewy. <laughs> uh, it's, she really, really loves bear. Uh, That's the best thing I've heard actually, all day. Yeah, and makes all these big growling noises when she eats it. No, we always wait. tell her what the food is. <laughs> we never hide who the food is. So yeah. she understands that when we're eating pork, that comes from a pig. Mm -hmm. When we're eating, you know, uh, poultry, that comes from a chicken. Because we want her to be aware that, you know, we're taking life to live. And yeah. this isn't something uh, for us to be ungrateful for. We want right. it to be exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. But the great thing lately is now she's able to... Um, remove seeds. She can eat the flesh off of fruit and remove the seed that's relatively new. So now things like black cherry and choke cherry and some of these things where we wouldn't want somebody young swallowing too many of the seeds
needs or what many mm-hmm. people call pits. Now I can, with supervision, she's able to do all that. So it's really great. She's eaten wild food since the very first time she started eating solid food. And there are some wild foods. I mean, it's she she prefers pin cherry over blueberry, for example. <laughs> you know, blueberry is spectacular. I don't even understand that one. Yeah. But, you know, she likes that astringency and that sourness of some of the wild wow. foods because she's been raised um, on them as a significant portion of her diet. Yeah. How interesting that it wouldn't be, you know, the sweetest thing or, or the most palatable thing, but but sometimes the weirdest thing that, that a child would want. Yeah, it's just not the case. I mean, I definitely think a lot of young children really um, migrate to sour flavors. Hmm. Uh, we have species of plants that grow even on our lawn that she uh, recognizes and she's allowed to forage on her own for. These are things like sheep sorrel and wood sorrel that have these really sour leaves and flowers. And she just gathers them the entire time that she's out just eating these things. Um, you know, they're really sour and she just digs that particular taste. That is so adorable. There must be some nutrient in there, maybe vitamin C, some antioxidant that her body has has realized is good for her and she kind of connects the dots naturally without knowing anything from the science books. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> Sheep sorrel is one of the main constituents of the anti-cancer formula called Essiac that was developed by an, a, you know, a, an Ojibwa Native American. Mm-hmm. Um, and who knows? I mean, there are so many things like that that we're trying to make sure that she um, cultivates or at least maintains a palate for that so many of us had to overcome our American palates. Like, right. you know, organ meats like liver, you know, it's like, oh, I just really... I'm not excited about it, except I understand these are some of the most nutrient-dense foods that are available to us. And so we learned ways like pate and meatloafs to, to... you know, start bringing these things mm-hmm. in until our taste buds got used to them. Fortunately, Samara has had those, uh, our daughter, since mm-hmm. um, very early on. Some of her first foods were poultry liver and things like that. And she eats it as if it's just, you know, a normal part of her diet now. Uh-huh. And it'll be really wonderful to watch somebody who doesn't have to unlearn and sort of reformulate their palate like many of us did um as adults, once we learned that traditional diets are much better for us. Yeah. Now, to shift gears a little bit, because I can't believe it, we're already coming up on time. But uh, one of the things that, that you're a strong advocate for is self-reliance. What does that mean in the modern world? <laughs> well, yeah, it, self-reliance is something that I, I think a lot of people have a misconception of. They think of this lone person going out into the forest, you know, naked Writing into the book. wilderness and <laughs> just build everything and they're yeah. and they're good to go and there's like nobody alive that practically has ever been able to do that humans have always lived in communities and you were always born into a community where people could share clothing and you know stone tools and baskets and containers and you learned how to make fire so for me self-reliance isn't about just me being, you know, man versus nature. It's about me and my community being able to do as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, but there are things that we rely on as well. I'm not a mechanic and I need a car mm-hmm. that I can get around. I'm not a carpenter, at least not a very good one, but yet a home so- sometimes need repairs. I-, I tend to focus my self-reliant skills in those ancestral life ways uh, Mm -hmm. arena. So I'm looking at being able to make fire, to learn how to gather and purify water, to feed myself, to heal myself, to build hunting weapons, um, and, and have those skills there. I mean, Abel, it is an amazing comforting position to sit in knowing that if there was an interruption to the services that we use, Mm -hmm. whether that be electricity, the distribution of food, I know that um, I'm not saying I can just survive indefinitely, but we'll get through any brief period like that with flying colors because we are capable of feeding ourselves and doing a lot of the things that many humans are not able to do anymore. Yeah. I love that. Well, um, I, you know, I found this on your website that I thought was so powerful. I'm just going to scroll down and read it for everyone. Uh, 
<laughs> it's pretty amazing that our society has reached a point where the effort necessary to extract oil from the ground, ship it to a refinery, turn it into plastic, ship it appropriately, or shape it appropriately, truck it to a store, buy it, and bring it home is considered to be less effort than what it takes to just wash the spoon when you're done with it. <laughs> and I thought that that was such a powerful illustration of the world that we live in today and how how much we just kind of take it totally for granted, you know, that, that we have disposable cutlery even. It's preposterous. Yes. We've, we've externalized all of the costs. Mm -hmm. And and essentially the, the cost of making that piece of, you know, plasticware, the cost is not only do we create all this pollution in its manufacture and even its recycling, but we've also, there's a cost to our own self-reliance because we're not even, we don't even know how to make utensils anymore mm -hmm. for us. It's an incredibly easy thing to do. It takes, you know, about five minutes to learn how to do this. But by externalizing all these costs, especially out onto the environment, all we're doing is sort of maxing out the world's ability to absorb pollution, which obviously is going to come back to harm us all in the long run. Yeah. Hi. Let's leave people with, with something that uh, is a little bit of hope, because I know I, I, I can see <laughs> it in your eyes right now that uh, obviously we need to make a change. There are ways that we can do it. What would you recommend to the people out there? that they can do to, to get closer to the world that we need to get to. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware like many people that you and I could have a, an entire series of these talks and do nothing but talk about what's wrong with the world. Sure. But, uh, I'm a, I'm a very hopeful person. Uh, people who know me and get to hang out with me, I don't think would describe me as a pessimist or depressed because there's answers to absolutely everything. Really, the biggest thing that we need to do is to develop some awareness of what's happening around us. And this might create some grief at first, but if you're a motivated individual, there is literally an answer to every single thing that we face. And I think that's the most important thing that people need to understand is it isn't hopeless, regardless of what anybody tells you, families and communities can do something about all of this. Whether you're trying to deal with a specific health problem, you're trying to navigate the purchasing world to find products that will come into your house that are not going to harm you and your family. You're looking for ways to get movement um, that you know, doesn't necessarily involve a gym membership if you don't have the money for that kind of thing. There's answers to absolutely everything. And you just need to connect with the right people to find out what those answers are. I love it. So Arthur, where can people find you and what are you working on now? Um, uh, I'm easy to find. I'm just at ArthurHaines.com, um, and you can find me. I, I had to uh, get involved in Facebook as well because I realized, you know, that's where so many people just yeah. spend time now that if I want to have a, a message that they can choose to, uh, you know, choose to listen to, that I had to go there as well. So I'm, I'm easy to find. Mm -hmm. um, I just finished up a, a second volume of uh, a foraging book called Ancestral Plants. Cool. And my foraging books don't just look at uh, food, but they look at food and herbal medicine and all of the other things that we can use plants for like dyes and basketry and hunting weapons and mm -hmm. you know these other things i like doing a much more holistic view of how we can interact with plants for our benefit um but what i'm working on right now is i've been contracted to write um two books one is a, a really large book on rewilding and that one's actually going to be pretty cool because you know like the paleo movement really sort of got people to understand that it's not just what you eat, but it's how you move. Yes. And yet there are more things and, you know, people need community. Mm -hmm. uh, they need loving relationships. They need to feel like they're appreciated by their community and that they have gifts mm -hmm. to offer. Um, and so I'm trying to write something that pulls in a much bigger lifestyle. So that will be the first book um, that I was asked to write. And the second one is actually on ancestral child rearing methods and how we can bring that into the way we raise our children today. That is so wonderful. Well, Arthur, this has been a true pleasure and a, a very powerful show. So thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate you inviting me on again. It was great. Thanks again for listening to Fat Burning Man. Don't forget, before you go, 
Check out fatburningtribe.com. If you have a question for me that you want answered about how to improve your performance, what to eat for dinner, how to drop fat quickly, how to improve your overall health or anything else, we answer all of your questions there. So quickly, you can get the first month for just $1 for a limited time. Check it out at fatburningtribe.com. All right, I'll see you there. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? Please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you, and if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. People dealing with that sleep apnea, their energy is so low and they're just struggling to even recover if they're doing any exercise or eating good food. This can give them a little bit of advantage to just get going. But the long-term goal is to not be married to that thing. You know, literally, it's getting in your marriage.